Good morning, everybody. So wonderful to see you and wonderful to be here. And uh, thank you for keeping the fires burning here in (laughs) the north of the river. I'm speaking today, uh, it's my message is titled, The Center of God's Hope. The Center of God's Hope. And we had a reading there uh, from Luke 19. This is where Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. If I can uh, read it again, he said, as, as he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Uh, The broad vision that we have is one that includes and embraces people of all faith, right? And I think that includes peace-loving, conscientious people as well who may not be sure about their own faith. Uh, And we're encouraging them to join us ultimately in one heavenly parents' holy community, a very beautiful idea when unificationists, at the center of that, uh, when they're embracing this inclusive community, um, I think we need to be the most forward, really, and proficient in exercising respect and understanding for the faith of others. It doesn't necessarily, I think, mean understanding the details of their faith, although that helps. Uh, but understanding the faith which they have and respecting the faith which they hold in whichever way that is expressed. So, um, you know, the details, of course, may differ from the teachings and the explanations that we fully accept, the things which, you know, brought us here. I would say still it remains that the foundation to receive true parents, that is our founders, uh, Reverend and Mrs. Moon, in their roles as the ones to bring complete salvation in this kind of end time, making this foundation, this was the purpose of worldwide Christianity. That's 2,000 years of investment and suffering and remarkable growth as well. And without building a bridge, without inheriting and connecting somehow to that extraordinary foundation, then certainly our unification movement is much weaker, more than we like to admit, I think, and the work which we're proposing will take longer. Are you with me? It's true, isn't it? That foundation, you know, I'm always staggered, especially when you travel around the country or around Europe, it's, The foundation is very visible in the churches and cathedrals, although it's suffering under pressures of the modern world. But nevertheless, it's it's amazing, a foundation which is there, and it's expressed in the uh, resources which they have, the mission work which they do, the charitable work, the the literature which they have, the education programs, you know, what they provide for communities around the country, just to speak of this country, is extraordinary. And it's kind of unsung work, really. You know, it's not really uh, appreciated perhaps as much as it should be in my my, uh, estimation. So the great parallel here is, of course, a shift, that shift between the first Israel prepared for the purpose of receiving the Messiah. In particular, this was Jesus. And the second Israel, the early Christians, led by the spiritual 
Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, we have to say that this divorce between Judaism and Christianity proved to be, I would say, one of the greatest tragedies of human history, uh, a tragedy of lost opportunities. And, you know, if you have to start something all over again, it's never the best way, is it? Right? And it's often not as good as it would have been if something had continued, you know, going right in the beginning. So, uh, in Matthew uh, 16, verse 18, I've got a few Bible quotes for you this morning. Huh? It says there, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Are you familiar with that, that uh, saying? Uh, this gives some idea you know, of a continuity of plan and execution. But when we just consider that a little bit, church, the word church, is not a word that Jesus would ever have used. Uh -huh. uh, just a moment's thought on this, and one can conclude that it's, it's written back into the Bible from a time later on when churches existed. And there was the beginning, maybe, even of rivalry between churches. So the argument became one between uh, especially Catholic and Protestant churches, uh, Catholics saying this indicate, this verse indicates that Peter, the founder of the church in Rome, and consequently a succession of popes, was destined to be the main vehicle for bringing in God's kingdom. Protestants read this same uh, verse and they saw in it testimonies, that testimonies to the work of Jesus would be that rock on which you know, the future of Christianity would be built. And the compliment they are paying there is to all the apostles, not to just one. So it's, a, you know, it's read differently, isn't it? And it's very easy to fall foul of a believer's own particular understanding. Matters of faith are taken very seriously, right? And it's, uh, it's understandable, it's for good reason, that people are very serious about their faith. So when that faith from anywhere, any direction, when it's challenged or undermined, it certainly uh, makes bridge building very difficult and it sets up kind of these uh, conflicts between believers, which is very tragic. However, bridge building is what we need to do, right, as unificationists. This is, this is our life, really. You know, I was teaching a minister and his wife, both pastors in North London, actually, and pastors in the Pentecostal tradition. And the husband was uh, particularly grateful for insights that the principal gives into the life and the mission of John the Baptist. It was like a revelation to him, you know, and he felt he'd really learned something very valuable. And of course, you know, uh, once you start uh, um, to be able to uh, accept uh, those explanations, it has a lot of ramifications, right, about the mission of Jesus and the way things went. So he absolutely, you know, ex you know took to that. His wife, however, took issue with a phrase that I used in you know, explaining these things. I talked about the need to complete the unfinished work of Jesus, now, that's my kind of way uh, of introducing the work of true parents, and it had worked for me in the past to talk about that. But her issue was not with who I thought was doing this work, but that she felt very strongly there is no unfinished work, right? So how can you say that, right? To her ears, it was like undermining the work of Jesus, and that was unacceptable. Jesus did it all. Have you heard this kind of explanation before, right? Um, but it's much more than an intellectual explanation. It's something passionately felt on which a person's faith is resting and is based. So it's very important for that reason to that person. So it's a wide, widely held view, certainly, in, uh, in Christian churches, but not universal. Uh, this became what I... I hope is just a temporary kind of uh, block for this person to hearing 
more, although I'm happy to say the couple are very keen to work with us. Uh, his idea even was to uh, uh, hire a big stadium in Wembley. Can you think of any? Yeah. <laughs> in order to have True Mother come and speak. This was his idea, getting him very excited. And he had had a revelation himself, which oddly he couldn't really understand or settle on, but he had had this vision of little fires breaking out all over the place. And when he started to hear uh, the message of divine principle, he understood what this meant. It meant we all have to join together in one big fire, right? A spiritual fire of real spiritual revolution and revival. It seemed simple, but he didn't kind of catch where this was coming from. And now he felt, well, this is where it's going to come from. Anyway, um, how we say things has to take account of a person's sincerely held beliefs. That was a kind of lesson to me at that moment. Now, our reading this morning uh, was the passage in Luke 19 where it tells of Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. It's a significant and a powerful attestation to Jesus' profound emotions, and it reveals many important things about the life and mission of Jesus. In fact, there's very few occasions where the Bible describes Jesus as weeping, but this is one of them. However, there was a time when that sentence was removed from the Bible, and it was only to be reinstated later. Why? Because Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem, but for those who could only see glory behind his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which was all part of this story, um, you know, how could Jesus be weeping when he's being welcomed victoriously? It seemed like a contradiction, right? So in the effort to emphasize the victorious nature of his entry, then they thought, well, we, let's take this out. <laughs> so I was interested to read a Presbyterian analysis of this story. It's offered by a Reverend Charles, Charles Seat. He's the minister of the Life Bible Presbyterian Church. But I found his sermon to be quite a scholarly sermon. And there he gives three reasons for Jesus weeping over the city. The first he gives is because of Jesus' unending desire for the peace of Jerusalem. If you read verse 42, I remind you, it said, if you had known, even you, talking about Jerusalem and all that Jerusalem stands for, really, especially in this, your day, the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. In other words, in other words that, that opportunity to really hear and understand the message of Jesus was now over. When he looked over the city from a neighboring hill, it would have looked magnificent in those days and gleaming, you know. And the temple complex was in the center of the mount. I believe it had been renovated some 15 years before the birth of Jesus. And I'm sure in anticipation for the coming of the Messiah, you know. And there was a kind of aspect of getting ready. All this is a little bit of another story. But Jesus felt such anguish, such agony and sorrow for the city and for the nation that it represents. He was the one who could show the way to genuine peace, but people were blocked from listening. So in his eyes, this whole, this the way things were turning out was utterly tragic, and the city and its inhabitants would only suffer. So this was this Presbyterian minister's first kind of point. Um, and he mentions John 11, because John 11 says, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. Again, very poignant, very, you know, agonizing words, really. He came to his own, and his own received him not, or didn't receive him. So because Jesus was not received, people, um, and the things that belong to peace are really hidden from their eyes. So this is the blindness of 
Israel to the message of Jesus, and he identifies this. His second point about you know, reason for Jesus weeping in this way is because of Jesus' unlimited knowledge of what would befall Jerusalem. And in verse 43, this is where Jesus says, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Really talking to the city quite personally in this way, but this is going to be the uh, imminent or foretold destruction. Jerusalem, of course, would be destroyed in 70 AD. His fortune and that of Israel, Jesus' fortune and that of Israel, are tied up, really, together. Um, and there's a spiritual principle here that I think we recognize, right? If true parents are welcomed on a state level, then the fortunes of that nation are certainly looking up, aren't they? But uh, when God's central figure is persecuted or their work is restricted or they're banned from entering a country, we feel this is just, it's not good for the nation, right, if that's going to happen. And we've been through these kind of experiences even in Europe. So we always fear that the fortunes of the nation are going to go down, and they probably will, you know, if God's central figure is being ignored or actively worked against or imprisoned or whatever happens. Now, we're told in John's gospel, right, that the chief ruler of rulers of Israel, they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So after his so-called triumphal entry uh, into Jerusalem, Jesus cleansed the holy temple. That's the phrase which is used. And that was where he overturned the money changers' uh, tables, and he really didn't care himself about doing things which were obviously, you know, uh, going to be seen as uh, creating public disorder. And, you know, he just was uh, angered to see the way that things were being misused and the temple was being defiled. What he says at that time is sometimes overlooked, and there are some very beautiful words. He says, do you not know that this house is to be a house of prayer for all nations? For all nations. And that was his kind of added to his disappointment and anger and, you know, his being upset. That phrase, for all nations, shows how his mind was set on bringing salvation beyond Israel. It has echoes of Isaiah as well. You know, uh, Israel did not understand its own spiritual importance. In Jesus' mind, this was the place for people from around the world, the known world at that time, anyway, to come and worship and to pray. And they were doing that. That's why there were money changers there, right? Uh, but they should have been welcomed unconditionally and not fleeced by the money changers for personal gain, right? So, you no, know, they saw tourists as a kind of money-making opportunity. Uh, what's new, right? So the Presbyterian minister that we're quoting here says, the cleansing of the temple shows the deep level of corruption that infected the religious level leadership of that time. It shows how deep the corruption was. And then he adds, and listen to this, he adds, but all these sins of Jerusalem were not as great as the sin of rejecting the Messiah. Well, a sin is going against God's law, right? This understanding then, you know, it's out there. Why then is there the idea that Jesus accomplished everything? Well, my view, this is just my view, but uh, uh, I would say that most theology is theology after the event. You know, it's looking back and trying to explain uh, events and the working behind those events. And implied in this view is the idea that because it happened a certain way, it was meant to happen that way. 
Uh, there's an aspect of predestination here because of the you know, prevailing view that God is an all-knowing God, all-powerful God, and omnipresent. We might not understand from a worldly perspective, but God's thinking and God's ways are beyond ours. So this is a way of interpreting the facts. And Christianity, it has to be said, found a way to make even the most tragic of circumstances translate into a victory for God. And of course, the resurrection of Jesus indeed showed a greater power at work, despite the fact that everything was thrown at Jesus and he died such a tragic death. No, I'm sure you've experienced it's, it's not uncommon in life for people to approach uh, tragedies in this kind of way. It kind of goes along with this theological approach to try to deal with things that they cannot explain. If a child dies in a family, for example, there are always people on hand to say such words as, well, maybe it was meant to happen this way, right? or who knows the reason, or God has a plan. No, it's not always the most helpful thing to say to the bereaved person, right? But it's sincerely meant, and it's, it's also in a way saying, well, we don't know, right? We don't know. And sometimes it's because it's unknowable, or sometimes it's just that, well, we don't know, you know? It's, a, it's just a factual. So I thought back to my lady minister. Do you remember her? <laughs> right. uh, who couldn't entertain any other thought than that Jesus' work was perfectly completed. And then I thought, well, actually, occasionally I find myself reading the odd obituary in the Times, you know, uh, when great people who've contributed to society die, do you ever read something like, she could not complete her mission? No. <laughs> or he failed to do all that God wanted him to do? You know, uh, well, that would be considered very cold and cruel, wouldn't it? And almost kind of arrogant to know what God's will is in that kind of situation. And how often do religious people speak as though they know God's will better than anyone else. It's a thing you really have to watch out for. It's not a very pleasant trait, really. And we know that when someone in our own community ascends, they come to the end of life, that too is a time for recognizing all the good that they did. And that simple act is healing, and it's uh, encouraging for all concerned, especially the family that they leave behind. We don't talk of unfinished missions or leaving work undone or this kind of thing, do we? It wouldn't be right. The third point that our Presbyterian minister gives as a reason, remember reasons as to why Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem. He said, because of Jesus' unbounded love for the people of Jerusalem. The account in Matthew chapter 23 records Jesus' love and desperate concern for Jerusalem at this point in his life, and it does it kind of a little different way. I mean, we read the story in Luke. In Matthew, it uh, is called the Lament over Jerusalem, and it reads, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken and desolate. We could say that expressed in these verses is the mother's love that emanates from heavenly parents' heart, right? It's a very tender love, a love of concern and compassion, and a longing to protect and shelter. Jesus is using this analogy of him himself and the kind of mother hen who wants to, you know, shelter and protect her chicks. Yeah. So, but that's a very motherly, motherly approach, isn't it? Um, and that's in response to what? It's in response to killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you. The same history, Hostility in response to God's efforts um, to, to help us that uh, Jesus himself is faced with. And it's only 
at his death that he, or rather it's not only at his death that he shows this kind of compassion, his heart of loving his enemy. I think this verse shows that it's, it really is his philosophy of life. You know, it's consistent, entirely consistent. And that, of course, makes him truly a man of integrity. And here in this verse, this lament over Jerusalem, it says Jesus wanted in his lifetime to do this often, to gather the people together like a hen gathers her brood. But the people did not respond. It means you know, this has been his heart all along and has been rebuffed. And you know, it's very painful actually after a time if your efforts to love or bring something of value to others is just ignored or thrown back in your face. It's very difficult to contend with. Okay, so I was uh, even more interested when I came across some words from our true father, Father Moon. Now, we know he could be quite blunt, right, about the sin and the tragedy of killing Jesus, but then when we think about it, our Presbyterian minister here came to the same conclusion. And actually, much of Christianity appreciates the tragedy of this story. It emerges naturally and best in the telling of that story, not in looking back through the lens of theology. So these are some words from True Father, if you allow me to quote them. He said, Jesus spent his whole life fulfilling his responsibility and mission. What he completed on earth during his 33 years, years of life secured an eternal and inviolable accomplishment. His gospel of faith and the example of his life will remain for eternity. Jesus took responsibility not only for his own generation, but also for all of history. Jesus single-handedly took responsibility to complete the providential will that God had been striving to fulfill for 4,000 years. Or another on the same topic. Jesus came to answer the universal questions, resolve humanity's sins, and solve the problem of death. Jesus was the only person who could provide solutions to these problems. Or, moreover, more than anyone else, Jesus lived a truthful life for the sake of God. Disregarding his personal life, he sought to elucidate the fundamental questions of the universe. Disregarding his own glory, he labored and sacrificed endlessly to fulfill the will of God. By virtue of his consistent heart and life, he was elevated before heaven as the foremost torchbearer representing all of history. That is why he could confidently cry out, believe in me. And finally, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What a bold statement, Father says. Was his way a treacherous mountain trail? No, it was a firm and solid road. Was his truth dim and obscure? No, he clearly knew everything that he spoke. He intended that his truth should be welcomed by all peoples, and it should become the measure of all truth. And finally, was his life one of dying or thriving? He lowered himself to serve others, yet as he said, those who humble themselves will be lifted up. And of course, that was what happened to him. So the teaching in which Jesus was so confident, that should be welcomed by all and should become the measure of all truth. This was surely what Jesus is referring to when he says things that make for peace. This is his teaching. And people had locked their ears from hearing this. So considering this, let's put these words alongside those in Father's speech at the first World Culture and Sports Festival. Do you remember that? That was back in 1992 in August. And he, in a way, describes this. But I, I feel that there's such a, an affinity here between Jesus and those things that make for peace and Father's explanation, which by virtue of his you know, um, 
being in an age where everything can be recorded straight away, is giving a fuller explanation, right? He says there, after I, after I received my calling at the age of 16, I spent years searching for the answer to precisely the problem of how to bring salvation to humankind. The result of that lonely search for truth is the new expression of God's truth that you refer today to as the unification principle, as Godism, or headwing thought. For proclaiming these teachings, I faced tremendous persecution and attack. I founded many other organizations for projects in a wide variety of fields. As the founder of these organizations and groups, I wish to affirm here this evening that their purpose is to bring about world peace according to the ideal of God and humanity. They're not created for the benefit of any particular group or political faction. They don't serve the narrow interests of any particular nation or state. Rather, they exist to bring happiness, peace, and freedom to God, the creator of the universe and to all humanity. Amen? Amen. Adieu. Our movement, therefore, brings salvation to all families, all nations, all continents, and finally, to the entire world. It's a movement to save the family, save the nation, and save the world. Now, the exposition of divine principle, our core text, asks this question. Why, then, did Jesus pray three times, my father, if it be possible, let this cup of death pass from me? Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. This, of course, is the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. But it continues the same kind of desperation that Jesus was feeling throughout that time, a desperation in the heart of Jesus that caused him to weep over the city before he entered. In the principle, it says, in truth, Jesus offered those desperate prayers because he knew well that his death would shatter the hope of attaining the kingdom of heaven on earth. This would be a tragic disappointment to God, who had worked so laboriously to realize this hope through the long ages since the fall. Furthermore, Jesus knew that humanity's afflictions would continue unrelieved until the time of his second coming. So Jesus' concern was uh, for the nation and the generations who would follow. For these reasons, he prayed so desperately to the point that the Bible says he sweated drops of blood. Well, these points actually mirror those made by the Presbyterian minister. And why I say this is because we too can be guilty of reducing or stereotyping Christian belief to a point where we only see something that's incompatible with the principle. But we have to avoid rigid thinking ourselves in order to make bridges and find a commonality of faith. So, on reflection, although it might have helped some people's understanding, talking of the unfinished work of Jesus, that was not the way to speak to this particular lady, right? And I should have sensed or known that, right? In the four quotations I offered from True Father, he takes quite a different approach. He recognizes Jesus' accomplishment. He writes or speaks a beautiful and truthful obituary of Jesus, really. Uh, you know, I would have not lost anything by saying to this lady, Jesus fulfilled everything God asked him to do, right? And then we'd be in perfect agreement, right? And we could talk more and go into details, right? So, because that is expressed in the principle too. The and more, you know, Jesus fulfilled everything God asked him to do and more. That and more refers to what Jesus did without God's help that released the power of resurrection and gained the upper hand over the devil at the moment of Jesus' death. And it's referred to actually in the last line of the divine principle chapter on Moses and Jesus. You know, it comes in the second part. It's chapter three in the part two. And... 
There it says, it's an interesting way to end, actually, that chapter, if you think about it. But often you find these little nuggets spread around and, you know, uh, without reading the whole, you're not going to catch it. And it says there, finally, Jesus' course shows that the greater a person's mission, the greater the test he will confront. Jesus came as the second Adam. To complete his mission, he had to restore through indemnity the position Adam had occupied prior to the fall. Since Adam became faithless and forsook God, Jesus had to restore Adam's mistake by enduring when God forsook him, all the while showing unchanging faith. Therefore, Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness and forsaken by God on the cross. Well, why am I drawing your attention to these things? Right? If the extensive and profound Christian foundation can be reached and reignited with the fire of spiritual revival to connect it to the revealed teaching of true parents, that's surely an absolute key to making significant progress and bringing in God's kingdom most quickly. True Mother has declared the goal of reaching one third of the world's population with the knowledge of God as our heavenly parent and bringing true parents blessing. Actually, one third of the world's population is Christian. So there's a direct tally there, right? You know, I've had unificationists tell me as a point of fact that Christianity rejected true parents. My answer to that, uh, such a statement is nonsense. I have to say, sorry. Most Christians have not been made aware of true parents through their teaching. You can't reject what you don't know or have not been properly introduced to. I think we all should be finding a voice at this time to connect to the Christian world. Uh, True Mother talks about it a lot. She really feels now is that kind of window of opportunity. You know, the past difficulties are over and forgiven and you know, we have our own strong and new foundation, but it's to be shared with everybody and it should go back to those people who are first and foremost prepared to receive true parents. So we need to make these brothers and sisters of faith the cornerstone of heavenly parents' holy community. And to do that, we need new thinking ourselves, right? We need a change of heart. We need courage. We need faith. We need hope. We have a new message or a new expression of truth. The approach that has helped me uh, in dealing with this is to genuinely think that what people believe, the way they interpret things, has been right and has served well in the past. I don't challenge it. You know? Let them believe it. Right? The principle is not a new and rival doctrine. Uh, if it is treated that way, it's a road, road of endless battles, really. Right? But it contains essential insights for our time that could not be shared before, but they can be shared now. They've been revealed to us through revelation and reason as God's preparing us for the second coming. And uh, whether they are or not, all Christians should be interested in that and should be concerned about that. And you will find many who are, many who are praying to find out about this at this very moment. It's because of the time we live in that we can know these things. And uh, as it says in John 16, 12, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. But now is the time when these things can be born. So it's not a matter of arguing with firmly held beliefs of the past. It's a matter of finding those people who are open to the new. And for sure, I tell you, there are many who have already been receiving these ideas contained in the principle in whole or in part. The principle doesn't exist in a box or between the covers of a book. We're talking about life and people are receiving these things and coming to some of these conclusions themselves, you know, through their own prayer and research. How we bring that message is of, 
is of key importance. But just the act of thinking and experimenting with that is, is really valuable. Like me, you might find yourself making mistakes, but you will learn from those mistakes. And in the process, life becomes richer and faith becomes deeper. Thank you. Please join me in prayer. Our loving heavenly parents, we thank you so much for always being there for us, for guiding us and for creating a path for humanity to go. This was described as like a, a highway in the desert. You know, that is almost a very modern concept, you know, such a fast means of travel, a clear, direct route through a world that's like a desert. But that has been formulated by you and won by you in conjunction with your children over centuries. And we want to tap into that and value what we have. We certainly don't want to make the mistakes that some people made 2,000 years ago. Rather, we want to learn from those mistakes and pray that all the rich and wonderful foundation of worldwide Christianity can come to serve your purpose as is being worked out today in this current climate and in the impending future. We thank you and we pray we can offer this time to you and redetermine ourselves to be these bridge builders and bridge makers. This I humbly ask and pray together with my brothers and sisters in our names, our Jews.